So this is your first um, debut feature. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of shorts before. This is your first big feature. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the challenges um, actually making a feature length film? Yeah, I mean, making a feature, strangely, just like making any other short, I, I, uh, I had a great team. Like, everyone was very young, and like my producers were working at a, a, like a bigger company that have done a lot of work, but they, um, but this is, that was their first feature also. So, you know, we were, we were all learning as we went along, but as a, as a result, there were no rules. Like we were shooting in no man's land new, of Newfoundland. So like we, there was a lot of freedom that we had shooting in my hometown. And I knew all the actors, I knew all the locations. So it's like, it, honestly, like it sounds super, unbelievable to say but it wasn't that challenging like it was actually like humblingly um organic in a way to make this movie like it actually there were no big like hitches the whole time it was like we were all friends we were all we all cared about this movie um and everyone was very passionate you deal with some very complex themes of sexuality in the film mm -hmm. and how did you translate that onto screen visually yeah i i mean i i Visually, I explore a lot of elements of like magic realism and um, and I guess like internalized homophobia takes on like a literal form in the film um, through this like ulcer that's growing in his stomach and getting bigger um, and I, I just wanted to I guess I just I'm interested in the mind and and in fear and overcoming fear um, as like a theme like in my work. Um, but what I love about cinema as like a medium is like the freedom you're able to um, achieve in how you want to explore that, those themes. Um, so I am, tend to always be drawn to like the heightened, more magic, realist elements. So who are some of the filmmakers who inspired you? Because when watching the film, um, there were so, some moments that reminded me very much of David Cronenberg, mm -hmm. 48 yeah. Element moments. Yeah, yeah, I, I do love David Cronenberg. Um, he, I think he is definitely like a touchstone for me, he's also like a Canadian, um, and, uh, and like David Lynch as well, or like people, I mean, the film's not very David Lynchian, but I'm strangely inspired by his like offbeat, but yet accessible like voice as a, as a filmmaker, but um, yeah, like I really, I'm, I'm really, I'm really inspired by like Spike Jones and um, Charlie Kaufman and Michel Gondry as well, people who, who are n not inhibit, inhibited by reality, but, but grasp it and push beyond. Like anyone who does that is like immediately my kind of filmmaker, but um, but yeah, it's strangely like the most important filmmaker to me has like nothing to do with this film, but like Jane Campion is like probably my hero. Um, and um, yeah, like she influences me in like different ways, but um, that's kind of the idea of... <laughs> I love David Lynch. I think he's incredible. I love how yeah. he, he never explains his films. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. I, I do too. Well, Isabella Rossellini did make it in, yeah. so I guess yeah. there is a little bit of Lynch in there. But yeah, I saw that and I thought, yeah, Lynch. And did you did you work with her? Yeah. So Isabella plays the voice of the talking hamster mm -hmm. Buffy, um, and I, yeah, I got to work. I got to work with her like that, which was like a total dream come true for me as like a huge like, Lynch fan and just a her fan like I'm a big fan of her, her she has a web series called Green Porno about the sexual reproduction of animals and she plays every animal in a really arts and crafts DIY kind of style and that's where I got the idea for casting her as, as Buffy the hamster because she's so she's so nurturing um, and and like such an animal lover like it just I couldn't get the idea out of my head. It wasn't the initial idea, actually. We, was, the initial idea was like a robot voice, but I just found like I wanted to, her to Buffy to be more, more human and relatable um, <laughs> as a, a talking hamster. Um, and I, yeah, I just 
that's kind of where the idea came from was, was through her like her love of animals and and uh, I guess like her just nurturing voice. I I um, I got the idea and pitched it to my producers and you know we had no money at the time to get like a star like her, um, but we sent her the script and she loved it and and and, and made sign on immediately. It was like uh, of course I will play the amps there. Like she was like amazing and, and so loving. Um, that's kind of how it came about. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a nice friendship with her now. Yeah, yeah, we keep in touch. And she tells me when she goes to Disney World and <laughs> um, But yeah, she's she's wonderful, like a very, very kind, thoughtful person. I was so lucky, I loved her. I, mean, mm -hmm. I love her in Blue Velvet. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. Oh my god, she's amazing. <laughs> So incredible in Blue Velvet. I mean, we never set out to make like an issue, like a gay film. Like the film, I don't see it as like a, a gay film. It's just a, about a character who is coming of age and does happen to be gay, but he also is an aspiring makeup effects artist and dealing with fear and, and, a, and a, 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 a difficult father. Like it's like it's just like one aspect of his personality, which is how I feel as as a man myself. Like it's it's not. Sexuality isn't something that defines you, it's just it's a part of you and you can use it however you want. And Oscar chooses not to use it for a long time because it's something he fears, he dreads. And um, it, it, it externalizes in this manifestation of fear. It's growing in his stomach and it's getting bigger and it's worse every time he's, he's, he's his sexuality is, is like peaked. It's something that, that gets worse and um, I um, I wanted to make a story about someone who chooses to accept that that about themselves and and, and um, challenges that fear to use it in a way that empowers them. I think everyone can understand that, especially the teenagers, that mm -hmm. fear. You know, because you, it is a time when you are very fearful mm -hmm. and you, it, you find it very hard to accept that. And even as adults, I think it's still very relevant mm -hmm. because some adults still have have never really accepted mm -hmm. that or, or challenged it or or used it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, the use of sound, I really like the use of sound. Mm -hmm. um, how do you use sound to um, dramatize um, the character's internal feelings? Well, sound is really important to us. So um, the film, in the film, uh, the character, the, as a child, witnesses a hate crime in which. Uh, a young man is sodomized uh, with a metal rod, which is something that actually happened in, in Newfoundland when I was growing up. And it instilled a lot of fear in me. It's very, very powerful. It's the origin of this, of this film. Um, but the sound, I chose to use metallic sounds, like clashing and banging and, 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 and slowed down metallic sounds as, as a way of scope of, of sculpting the soundscape it's in a way that echoes this internalized fear that's growing in his, in his head and whenever fear is present so is that the, so are those metallic elements um, and, and so I, that, that was something that was like really um, important to me it's like in the score it's in it's hidden and it's not something you might notice right away but maybe on a second viewing you can catch those those elements um, uh, and I don't know, it doesn't even matter, it's for me, it's, it's, that's the build of this film. Was, um, um, how, how did the script develop? How, how long did it take you? Um, it, it came pretty quickly, actually, like the development of this, of this story. Just, it was, it was, there was not a lot, a lot of like pre-planning, I just, it was some, a story that I had to tell. There was no, there were no questions about that. Like for me, I just I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I had to tell, had to tell the story, and I think we were probably writing it. I was I wrote it for probably like I don't know eight eight months or to a year before we were shooting, uh, and then it kind of it happened fairly quickly um, in terms of um, the usual um, trajectory of like making films in Canada. And what's next for you now? So I'm developing my next feature, uh, which is about the Newfoundland resettlement, which is a period of history where 50,000 people were forced to resettle off of small islands around the coast of Newfoundland, but they weren't given enough money. So the government, so they were essentially forced to float their houses across the Atlantic Ocean 
uh, and move on to the mainland. So the film is about a family who get lost while they're trapped, they're floating their house on the water. Sounds amazing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, um, do you have a do you have a script moment? Yeah. So it's, I've been developed. I, the script won the San Francisco Film Society Filmmaker 360 grant, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and also I won an award at TIFF this year called the Len Blum Award. And it's called What Waits for Them in Darkness. And uh, yeah, it's like a survivalist adventure fantasy film.